it's sharing the burden it's not necessarily problematizing everything so that everything is reflected in a negative way and we're trying to get more and, and find this marginal uh, gain as we can <laughs> we won't scratch the surface of that but this extra one percent when really um the, there's so many cracks in the foundation so there is this weight that we know that's existed for a really long time in high performance that, that medals have certain values and what it takes to win. I'm delighted to see that we have what it takes to win well. Do I think we're living and breathing it? No. Um, is it a longer time coming? Yes, it is. But we have to stick to that and the consistency when people talk about high performance and what high performance is, although the book isn't just for high performance coaches. I've seen that this, we need to be consistent across a multitude of different areas to support people in this area. And then the ripple effect will start to come. Well, welcome to the podcast, Jen, Amy. How are you both? Um, I've asked you that question, but I'll direct it to Jen first because you're left on my screen. Yes, I'm good. I'm delighted to be here, Steve. I'm really looking forward to the next hour together. Um, it's been a long time coming to, to um, get on the podcast and have a great conversation with you. So I can only imagine it's going to go off in all different directions. <laughs> and how are you, Amy? Yeah, great. Thanks. Looking forward to the chat. So look, if I just set the scene, it, it's maybe it's a little bit too crass of me to jump straight into talking about your book, but I will, or the book that you've edited, co-edited. Um, but I think that's, that sets the scene to why you're both on as a duet on the podcast. So um, we'll, perhaps we'll get into the, the topics covered in the book, Myths of Sport Coaching. Um, and that's the reason I've, I've asked you both on. But can you just give us a bit of a background? Let's go in the other direction. Um, Amy, do you want to kick us off? Just tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, and sort of why also you've sort of led to this 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 book. That'd be great to hear. Yeah, no problem. Um, I am a, a reader in sports psychology and coaching at Liverpool John Mars University. Um, I'm also a sport and exercise psychologist. So I think from, from a book perspective, um, and from my role perspective, this book fits really well into the program that I work on. So I work on a sport coaching program. Um, we always kind of challenge students to do projects that are novel and um, to, to consider, you know, critically the, the different concepts within coaching. And I think every single one of these chapters is something that is relevant to, to what we teach and also that can promote that critical thinking. So things that are always taken for granted in coaching, like learning styles, that I'm sure we'll get into, you know, the culture around coaching, coaching men and women, do we coach them differently? You know, do we need to care? All of them things, the, the 20 chapters that, that are covered in the book um, are super relevant from a, an academic perspective, but also I'm sure Jen will like follow on from this, but when we look at, coaching on the ground and, and the everyday myths or challenges that coaches come across again are echoed in the the chapters that, that we're covering so that's what we wanted with the book we wanted a, an academic perspective but we also wanted it to be real world applicable to to your everyday coach from grassroots to the league and, and I think you know I'm biased but I think we've done a good job of kind of hitting that brief yeah fantastic okay so that so can I assume to a certain extent that you're kind of coming at this from a, an academic? Let's make sure we've got evidence base. We've got uh, we've got the rigor and the and the the objectivity behind some of the the concepts that are at play. Um, Jen, do you want to give us your, yeah. your background too? Yeah, yeah, I will. But I'll, I'll just extend that um, point that you just made there, Steve, because it's really important that amplified probably during COVID, where people had access to more people through social channels and Zoom and people were a little bit more giving with their time. What we did start to notice is this copy and paste coaching that people started to grab a little bit from a webinar and um, didn't have many people or weren't on the ground to help them digest or contextualize what they'd heard. So underpinning or having evidence base was really important while we're putting the, the thoughts, the chapters, the people um, together. It's 32 authors, 32, 34 authors um, from 12 different countries. Um, with a mix of academia and um, 
kind of on, on the ground at different levels as well, not just in that high performance window um, from the practitioner side of things. So my background is um, coaching and playing basketball internationally for a number of years and swimming and other sports before that. And that kind of pattern of multi-sports has continued in the coach development space that I'm operating in for the last few years um, since I came to the UK and then into the new um, role at West Ham, which have just completed a season as head of performance and well-being. And I've tagged well-being at the end um, just to get it in the door. <laughs> a title doesn't massively matter to me once it's on the agenda. And I think when I link the well-being piece to these chapters, it's about the person. Um, you'll hear as we discuss the chapters of the book that the person and uh, knowing who they are, their motivations, that's a thread that goes through all 20 of the chapters in different ways. So it was really important for us to go, hey, listen, here's the evidence. There's loads of further reading because they're all referenced. The style of the chapter, as Amy has said, is, is a here's some information, here's some myths that will challenge, not necessarily debunking every single thing that you've ever thought. And people are leaving the book going, oh, what, what am I a coach? What's just happened? And then having some practical implications at the end of the chapter. There's a QR code there, which you'll have seen and some of the readers will have uh, come across that, again, has that extra little bit of um, context, but also connectivity to the authors who've given up their time and many, many years of research or coaching um, to share a little bit of them. So you get a little bit extra and the chapter summary. Uh, so that's it. You know, it's really, really important. There, there's so many topics that we haven't discussed here that are going to be, you know, in the next stage of um, another book. But I think for now, as we flow through some of the headings, people will go, yeah, that's really relevant to me now or post season. Actually, what, you know, now I can pick up this chapter, dive into it and, and go back to it at a later stage. Mm, interesting. And can I just pick up on that, that comment that you made there, Jen, about the, the fact that you'd noticed or you'd an observation, you'd noticed that people were sort of cherry picking or <clears throat> taking lessons from quite, quite an open church of access of let's do webinars and everyone's everyone's got zoom these days you can invite link and you can connect and here's my thought on this here's my thought on that that might have set off a different set of practices that was perhaps just less organized less thought through i don't know i'm just i'm just assuming from some of the the words there where where people were trying to apply lots of principles perhaps without the, the due consideration. Am I hearing you correctly at all there? Yeah, absolutely. And initially I thought it was a really cool thing, a real um, um, advantageous position people were in during a negative period of, oh, I've got to work from home or actually I might have lost my job. But oh, look at all these amazing people who are giving up their time, webinars everywhere, the whole like accordion of things that you could pick from at any time of the day or evening you wanted to. But the positive of that then soon became well what's the underpin that i uh, sorry what's the foundation um how am i arriving at this webinar and then at the end of the webinar i'm asked for my takeaways i'm asked for my quick summary of things so people then moved on maybe four or five webinars in a week to two or three a day where i was working with probably 30 40 coaches at the time during that period and i could hear this on a regular basis coming back and oh uh, our NGB held this, but I was also onto this American coach and I was in you know, Australia the other day virtually going through all these uh, different key areas that they thought were relevant. They weren't on the ground, which I think has a certain consideration, but as you said there in some areas so well, that they, they were literally cherry picking bits and pieces, which if they had a solid foundation and it was really relevant and they had access to maybe their environment explored, I would say how cool, because I've, you know, even in this last week been in a great position where something just added a bit of clarity and it was a nice takeaway that I could have with me. But I, it was really relevant and I had a solid base and it was underpinned. So I don't think people had, coming back to some of the communities of practice that I was part of and listening to some conversations, I thought, oh, gosh, let's let's really get this book moving to a space where people can challenge their way of thinking. Mm. So so what was the um, what was the instigator for the book? What was the spark? Was it a conversation in a bar where you're getting frustrated or... I'm annoyed about this. I'm annoyed about that. Yeah, we should do something. Let's write a book. Um, what was the, what, how did this start? I'm so, sorry to disappoint. We were in lockdown, so we weren't allowed to have conversations in bars. <laughs> oh, is that a Zoom breakout room, was it? Well, so <laughs> we do have to credit the, the publisher, Andy. Um, he kind of came to us with like 
the idea, I guess, um, just the concept. And I think originally he wanted to be a bit of a pop, you know, a um, hundred myths, but uh, me and Jen had discussions and we wanted it to be more meaty. We wanted it to be like underpinned um, and, you know, myths aren't, can't be, answered. these kind of myths can't be answered with a, you know, 500 word paragraph or a couple of paragraphs. Um, so yeah, we wanted something with a bit more substance. And also we wanted the myths to be completely informed by coaches, um, not just, you know, mine and Jen's ideas. So that's why I kind of, I guess Jen's the, the she, Jen, where Jen was working at the time, and, and she still is um, constantly with coaches on a day-to-day -day basis. So kind of that's where we start, the, the myths start to evolve, like what myths is Jen seeing? Um, even going to my students and asking them, you know, what, what do you see um, in terms of myths that are out there? Like, I keep going back to learning styles because, you know, that is constantly still used, but there is quite a lot of literature to say that it's, there's no evidence in that. 10,000 hours, you know, is, an, is another obvious one. But then there are myths, other myths around kind of reflective practice or um, uh, caring and coaching that no one's really kind of, we're, we're not challenging so much. Um, and, and we know like some real world leading researchers within these areas. So we, we kind of tapped into them like gender again, like coaches are constantly coming to us saying like Amy Jen, like I'm, I'm coaching this women's team now and I'm not used to it. And you know, how, how, what, how do women take like, what is there anything reading I can do to, to help me to coach these, these females. Um, so this, these look like kind of constant things that we're being like faced with is, coach developers, spot psychologists, you know, um, people working with coaches. Um, so yes, I'm sorry to say it didn't, it wasn't in a pub. No, well, you mentioned a couple of topics a, a few times already then. So um, was there, were there a few topics that were sort of first on the team sheet as to, um, okay, well, we could do 101 myths, but maybe by the time we've got to 60 and 70, we'll be maybe running out of energy a little bit but what's the what are the top few that you thought that's nailed on that's going in the book the uh, and others will follow it um so for me I'll, Jen, I'll let you jump in afterwards but um 10,000 hours we've got actually two chapters linking to that and again that's something else from the book's perspective that we wanted to make sure we're hitting a different perspective so we had like physiologist or physio perspective a kind of um sociology perspectives of things a psycho psychologist perspective so 10,000 hours gender so we've got two chapters on gender one from a coaching perspective so why um you know why is it so difficult for women coaches to coach in the elite setting so is women's sport a stepping stone for men mm -hmm. um to, to move into the men's game and then also the, with, there's a gender chapter around you know are women a different kettle of fish to coach um, and then learning styles, I think. So there, for me, like gender, 10,000 hours and, and learning styles are probably the, the top three, um, you know, obvious ones. Jen, I don't know if you think any otherwise. I'm smiling away because it was it, it definitely was, there was one or two there that you've mentioned that got the ball rolling. But as soon as we started to have conversations or go out to coaches or just observe what was on offer from different NGBs to see what they, I, I assume what their research had brought to the forefront, we were nodding away. Like if, if anybody opens any of the chapters, I'm sure there's three or four straight away that will come up and go, oh yeah, you know, of deliberate practice, you know, oh, what about, you know, you hear the, the I must ask lots of questions in my coaching sessions. So we went, you know, straight to Mark and we we're like, hey, you know, Mark Partington wrote a chapter on questioning coaching. Uh, does it lead to learning? So let's let's have, you know, a dive into that. There's some stuff on nutrition, which we, you know, it's not it's a topic that's always to the left or to the right of the main core of the performance support team. In, in my view, sometimes if they've got it right, they're integrated. So we tried to integrate this into the conversation by having a chapter here that people could pick up but um there's definitely some that amy mentioned uh learning styles there we hosted a session 
which we might get to later, but in essence, we've asked all the, the chapter authors, would they be interested in giving a free hour of their time for one, um, one slot in a month? And all of a sudden, up until November 2023, we've all the authors now have given one hour to deep dive into their chapter. And we started on learning styles with Anna Stodder and she, Anna's fantastic, gave us a 20 minute snippet at the start. And the Q and A's were, why is it still on my um, level two? You know, I was at a workshop the other day. It was really honest, really open. And she wasn't there to, you know, point fingers at anybody, but it was really that vehicle for conversation, uh, a window and a space, first of all, for us to get into that. But then for them to say, if, if not them themselves, to up manager, to have that conversation, to bring the book or to bring the link to the session and say, hey, listen, we need to challenge this or we need to change something. Um, but yeah, like resilience, we hear, you know, you're a resilient athlete. A lot of coaches either speak that or have heard that. So we wanted to go to Mustafa and Joel and say, hey, listen, what's going on there? Can you give us um, a nice summary of your amazing research with some practical implications so we can see that continuum? Uh, we, I could probably, you know, go all, go all um, podcasts talking about the different areas. But there's some, like I said there, as soon as you get into one or two, you're like, oh, but what about this? What about this? And I suppose it alludes to a particular perspective that the I don't know whether it underpinned the motivation behind it, but um, of setting a different agenda. When when a, a a book contains a topic of which the title is myths, um, I, <laughs> it was there a particular a pro provocative approach that you wanted to actually say, well, look, we need to be better that, than just going with. Uh, sloppy inclusion of particular topics on a uh, coach curriculum or you know we're going back to the 70s and 80s when when some of these curricula were developed and we haven't really evolved them since and um, is there a particular needle that you're just you're just jabbing there a little bit with it <laughs> I'm smiling away I'm sure Amy can um, add yeah. the political um summary of this but i it's somewhat of a sandwich effect so you in their mind we've got as amy mentioned some of the students because we go to there for their voice to, to chat and see what's on the ground in their space but equally for those looking at dissertation topics for those coming to their final year can they pick up this book and then have some um ways of challenging maybe some of the the formal paths that they've they've come across not just obviously in the university space but into the organizations and then the other side is as you've mentioned there steve the gatekeepers who have been in the positions that they're in for a really long time with nobody challenging them so if we come in the middle of that and then people in that space with support can go either side and say you know hey new coaches coming into this space have a look at this and they kind of go yeah i've read that book i've read that chapter great i'm coming into an environment where i feel we can learn together or going to those people who've been in that organization and said hey i know you did your level two three four 15 years ago but have we thought about you know x chapter or this topic and um, can we you know dig in a little bit more maybe we get some of these authors to come and have a conversation and um, so there is a little bit of that vulnerability and um, check and challenge that we want to, to to nudge and prod and as amy said there's loads of examples already of different organizations who've said i love it i'm getting it out to the masses we're hoping that in the university cycle some of these um, chapter authors are key people to put it on reading lists mainly just again to spread the world uh, the word um and, and equally with ngbs to have a, a consideration when they're designing or redesigning some stuff and i think just to follow up on that what we what the authors have done really well is not be too aggressive in like the the message and um, because it is it is it's quite a you know a vulnerable thing for a coach to be able to go or an organization to go we've read your book and we are still including learning styles within our coach education and we're reviewing that now and we have actually had quite a few uh, through the webinar and just through people getting in touch to say you know we are reviewing certain things now because of the evidence provided within the chapters um, and we've tried to kind of in in the introduction just we don't want to make coaches feel bad or you know even academics that i know are still teaching learning styles we're not here to like kind of tell people off we're just here to say okay have a little think about this um, don't just take everything for granted um, and, and think about it from a, a different perspective and, and, you know, encourage people to challenge 
some of the things that they're reading or hearing um, within coach education or everyday coaching practice. Yeah, and um, maybe you should, maybe you could set up some sort of merchandise that goes with it that comes with a rubber stamp of, mu- <laughs> of myth and um, you get a curriculum through and you just can rubber stamp the, the, the myth and then just hand it back to... Um, to yeah. whoever gave it to you, I, I, I've I've um, I've seen I've seen them. I, I like the motives of actually want to put a little bit of a lens here through. We want to to try and make things better, and therefore this is a book about questioning some of the things that we've hold, held dear for a while, some of the things that we parroted ourselves, some of the things that actually have really not shown themselves to be particularly effective or true truisms. Um, but I like that. I like that perspective that, that you share there, Amy, about the the next generation, the people that are doing the coaching courses now. And why, why would we be passing those on? We should be trying to make things better for them. And um, I, I've just been struck by this recently. This is off topic now, so a slight rant, but um, supporting my daughter through A-level PE. And now I did, I did that when it was five years old as an as an exam it, in 1993 and there's the same stuff in there from 1993 about lactate being a waste product uh, flushing toxins with sports massage and and stuff that should have just been corrected but it hasn't because it's just legacy why would we it takes effort and um and it also requires retraining and changing our slides um, and so that that question that comes back from my daughter of well, why why is it why have they kept stuff in there that's that I would have to have to relearn a different version at university? Well, I haven't got a g- decent answer for you, um, but you're going to have to repeat some of that stuff that's not right to get past the exam. And I suppose that's true for coaches in a in a whatever curriculum too. Um, that's a great point. And end of rant. A, no, 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 I mean, you, it's a great point. <laughs> the two of us nodding on. You're right. And I think, so there's a financial implication there, isn't there? Yeah. And I think linking, again, coming back to learning styles. And if so, an NGB has spent a lot of time, money, designing the curriculum, teaching a certain topic on a coach education course. And if they then have to change it, um, create new resources is expensive it's time consuming and if they don't see a problem with it and it and they see it as working then you know why why are they going to change it um, but just yeah. to just to follow up with you Steve my wife's a, a PE teacher <laughs> and, and she's sometimes um, pulling her hair out because she's like I'm teaching things that I know isn't true <laughs> because <laughs> I'm, yeah. te- I'm teaching to the curriculum and I have to teach it this way for them to pass the exam I bought I bought some um, noise cancelling Bose headphones during lockdown because um, back there was were the, the lessons were going on and I was thinking I just can't I can't concentrate I could have to block this out um, what was the other point I was going to ask you it was about a point that you made about how the I, I really noticed that the introductory aspect of the chapters was done in a considerate way it wasn't in a case of ah this is wrong it was very much a case of this is probably the reasons to why this might have occurred um what would have been an example um i'm trying to remember the chapter um heading now but it was it was about leadership styles and um uh it was about we probably take this um approach of cruel to be kind probably because the fundamental research around leadership came from dominant leader which was really relevant at that time um, or was the prevailing successful narrative of what it takes to be a leader probably in business and so it was copy and pasted and i, I just like that understanding and i thought that was quite considerate of the authors just to be able to position the subject you th- we don't let's not beat ourselves up about this this has come from a from history and this is probably why we are uh, using this as a, as a principle was that something that's part of the the brief that you wanted to make sure that this is consistent through the chapters yeah and that's a great um 
That's a great point to make the the care and coaching chapter in particular. It's the hook. It's the relatable element. I mean, I, I'm not saying that all books that are heavily academic are are not um, pick up and drop and digestible pieces of um, great material. But we wanted to make sure that if a coach who's coaching grassroots on a Sunday morning or is just getting involved because their kid is of a certain age and they want to be part of the team, that they can go, oh, OK, the 19 sport films um, that in this particular care and coaching intro the 19 sport films that were analyzed showed 346 incidents of emotional abuse of coaching what what movies are they are they are they the coach carter movie that everybody when we get into a room says is one of my favorite movies or is a couple of the documentaries that have come out or docuseries on netflix that show coaching and people are yeah look how hard they're working and then he goes on in that in that chapter intro to, to kind of highlight what they are they're the yelling the name calling the threatening athletes and the demanding excessive exercise and this punishment. So that is a, a, a dotted across, I think, in the learning styles chapter, Anna does the same, where the intro is, oh, on, you know, a course in the, the UK and in Ireland, it was only two years ago that this was part of the curriculum, you know, and it's the, oh, yeah, I was on that course, or I've been part of that, and it jogs their memory, and that's the hook for the rest of the chapter. But it's it's padded then with, um great as we said at the start kind of implications that they can not necessarily just take away immediately but considerations for their own practice their own environment or for conversations if they're in a different position to coaching but that was really important with the language aligned and that was amy's and um, myself our job to kind of take all the chapters then and see what was best placed in what position um in the book and how could we help uh, support the reader if they were going to um, have a little path or journey through what would, would we like them to enjoy that and part of the brief that we give all authors is to explain, you know, where has the myth come from? Um, and like I said earlier, it's to, so I don't want people, we don't want people to put the book up and them getting a telling off for, you know, believing this wrong thing. We want them to kind of, we want to share their um, potential reasonings for why we also come across and, and believe in some of these myths as in ourselves uh, and it's so common and it's okay like it's okay that um you know we might have bought into all of these myths at some point in our um career but we just want to challenge um people's thinking and just get people to reflect on you know where's it come from why is it a myth why is there some truth in there and what can we do differently moving forward as a coach hmm. so um that's useful background because it it sort of just surfaces in my mind an idea that are some of these concepts I suppose redundant but they don't necessarily do any harm but other concepts in here there's there's a cost and there's there's an impact upon somebody's health and well-being I'm thinking of nutrition I'm thinking about um uh, about being cruel to be kind and lacking care and so there is a cost to the human that that might be the recipient of poor coaching but is there another category here where well it doesn't really matter a learning style whether it's visual or kinesthetic probably just means there's more variety in the coaching method um, I don't know I'm, I'm, I'm just freestyling here a little bit as to are we effectively saying some some of these you just shouldn't be doing and others, well, it's just not very effective coaching? I'm going to jump in with a smile on my face here because one of the recent conversations I was having with someone, they asked that question. They said, well, listen, do I just take it out? Do I take learning styles out completely and do I not do it anymore? And I, I paused, obviously, because I wanted them to you know, use some <laughs> questioning to kind of get to the crux of why they were so frustrated and that they had reached a point where things were either they were seeking or things were coming at them, um, you know, at a fast pace and they needed to know the right and wrong. I thought, oh, gosh, what a weird position we're in where we just need one or the, the other. And then on reflection, Amy and I, after that particular conversation, I said, well, actually, in this case, where we know that the research has challenged learning styles and the four because I think Anna in the chapter explains that there's a multitude of different angles was in its first instance it was saying to coaches hey have you thought about different ways to work with the people in front of you 
then we had the commercialization, the reporting, you pay for this and boxing and labeling people off. So people felt secure that they knew something and they could answer it. And then if, if someone says like, what's, you know, what's this athlete, this athlete, this athlete, they could give you an answer, which meant they could be perceived in a certain way or progress down a certain path. Um, and actually what's really nice about all of these um, chapters is that there's a chance to challenge whether you actually do want to proceed with what you're doing and in the learning styles one and there's probably a couple more I would strongly say then if we said that there was some elements of safeguarding that were wrong and hurtful and harmful then we'd say no don't do it learning styles if we say that a person only learns in this way and we never try anything else that is harmful it's not harmful from a sense that they can't progress it's the enjoyment of the sport it's all the other stuff around that is their um their sense of autonomy and mastery and that motivational element that they might not get from the session and if we tap back into why as a coach in particular you started coaching then maybe the love for you know the learner and the in enjoyment of the sport is is lost a bit if you're trying to funnel something into one space because you need to be perceived that you know the answer to this as a right or wrong way of doing it so that was kind of a, a thing recently that I toyed with because there were so many people saying well is it should we definitely not do it then can I take it off um, and for a lot as I said for a lot of the chapters there it's just the check and challenge part but for this particular one and maybe one or two others there was this well we're set, what we are saying is that there's no there's no proof behind this and it was very much commercialized and went down a different avenue so if you pause for a minute and think if I only do something in a in a kinesthetic way is there there's some auditory that's coming across in the description but outside that um, we might miss other areas a multitude of actually other areas that the people in front of us as learners could um, not enjoy the experience. Mm. Um, Amy, would would it be okay for you to just sort of box the learning styles one off a little bit for us? Because we've mentioned learning styles and we haven't perhaps given the what's the sort of headline take home news from from that particular chapter around the evidence as to its uh, effectiveness. So to, to summarise, I guess the Anna Stodder um, quite nicely puts in, in the webinar and in the chapter that there is no evidence, um, especially within um, within coaching. Um, there might be some or one research study that's kind of looked at um, learning styles and whether we take learning styles into consideration, does it have a an, an effect or an improvement on the learning of the individual but it's definitely not within coaching I think the it can be quite detrimental if we if, if we teach to a person's learning style it can potentially make them lazy because we're not kind of stretching them to to, to learn outside of their style and we're just catering um to their needs which obviously is a good thing in one respect but um, if if we're not promoting you know other ways of learning then you know how are they gonna then um i don't know how to put it it's not going to be beneficial for them in other contexts um and as well um anna talks about you know rather than looking at learning styles why don't we just study the the individual from a biography perspective so spend your time and resources getting to know the individual and their history which is much more beneficial in understanding, you know, if they're visual, kinesthetic, auditory learners. Yeah, I mean, I suppose to me it just just makes sense to keep things varied. That if you're if you're if you're sat reading the same material, or if you're looking um, at it, or you're listening at it all the time, the same way all the time, um, it, it doesn't just doesn't seem to strengthen the learning as much as it would do if it if it just had. Right, we're going to concentrate on this for a bit, and now we're going to switch it up. And I suppose, as a as as a physiologist, that you're always looking for uh, that avoidance of monotony, so that a, an athlete stays fresh because they're engaged and they're and they're into it. And this is challenging. This is this is different from what I was expecting this to be, versus the same old, same old. And therefore, if I deliver the same training stimulus probably the, the body's going to go yeah uh, I'm a, I've already adapted to that yeah and the crux of it is there's absolutely no evidence to support that coaching someone in a specific style benefits their development and learning done 
Myth. We got our merch rubber stamp. (laughs) Myth. Um, So, uh, but then, so so if we take that concept of, okay, some, well, there's no evidence, but maybe, and and there's maybe some detrimental effects to the effectiveness of learning. Um, I I was struck by um, a few of the other, the chapters, such as the 24-hour coach. And I, I was intrigued and, and almost probably, I'm, I'm I was curious to your motives behind the book, but it, that felt like a chapter that perhaps some people aren't really asking for or some people aren't sort of searching for, but actually it needs to go in there. <laughs> it needs to be part of this campaign, this part of this book to change the conversation, to, to illuminate it a little bit and just to start thinking about what the potential cost would be. Um, I'm, I was struck by a particular phrase in there. I'm going to have to have to fiddle with the search for the book there, actually. Hang on a moment. Um, I've got all the same coloured post-it notes. That's very sloppy of me, isn't it? That doesn't really make <laughs> good sense, does it? That? Ah, OK. Here's, so here, I was struck by a particular phrase. Demands are inevitable, but coping efforts determine responses and outcomes. And I suppose again, there was a cute, there was a, a due consideration that coaching can be the, and often is a very demanding or, and all-consuming profession. Um, but we need to be we need to be supporting each other, but also we need to be looking for a more effective way of, of doing this. I'll jump in quickly on that because um, there's some really great lines that are really thought provoking in that chapter, a chapter that in the new role I went into and um, in the last five years working with high performance coaches had seen firsthand and heard firsthand in different ways. And another line um, just to to have an intro to this answer is uh, qualities of great sport coaching by leading organizations such as the International Olympic Committee that detail coaching in many ways is a 24-7, 365 days a year job as top coaches live and sleep the art of coaching. And why, just to couple with the, the great statement that you've made as well, you know, where are they getting away from this mentality or how are they being more, like it's not a case of keep working at this pace and we'll keep supporting you. It's actually, let's take a pause moment and acknowledge that there's a different way of doing something. So, you know, it's not just more self-help books that we need to get out there. We need to understand why people need them in the first place. And I've heard that's the way we do it. First in, last out, you know, and there's all these books on different types of leadership that says, you know, we'll do this and we'll do that. And I I think this chapter is absolutely incredible uh, at, at making people think about, well, how, what support do I need? What am I doing first of all? Why am I doing it? Am I in touch with the original reason I did this? Uh, the motivations, exa- um, for example. Then there's this element of persistence and this resilience that people need to have to be at this level. When I worked with one particular sport and they have their national competitions all the way through the year, but then they have two big ones that they have in the summer and they run them back to back. So the coaches are up at all hours Um, in the morning and the evening working through a whole competition schedule they have a weekend break and then they go into another one Um, as well as different competitions throughout the year and and the sport itself is quite demanding and I thought well we've got to press pause here at some point and say well you know are these ways of operating the most effective and efficient what about the people inside them and this best version of themselves I know we can't have that on a consistent basis but can we understand what they need do they understand what they need can we help them have a conversation instead of going oh here's a coach developer and a mentor and a therapist and just keep going <laughs> you know I think Amy's got some really good examples of different um, kind of commentaries that different people have made that she's been on her tours around the world uh, delivering at conferences but it's this uh, perception that if I go in first in the morning I've worked really hard till late in the evening we're doing a great job and this is this chapter helps us to unpick. Uh, Jen just threw you the baton there Amy do you want to pick that one up? Yeah I always use this example of when I was at a coaching conference in Tokyo so it was a coach I think it was an English coach so obviously time difference you know is drastically different and the coach is keynote and he says so oh, like sorry I'm tired I've been up since 2am supporting my athletes and you know everyone had a laugh and 
he patted himself on the back for it and actually like that I was just thinking why why haven't you got um you know why haven't you put things in place that where your assistant coach or the the people that you work with can do that coaching for you and that just made me think it's really sad that this poor person has to <laughs> think that he has to work 24 7 um and he's probably quite burnt out and tired and you know like the the, the chapter talks about you know burnout and there's a lot of like discussion around mental health within coaching and you know when do coaches get headspace when do they get time um like I always use Norway as a really nice example not from a I don't know as too much about like coaching in Norway but the culture in Norway is you work for eight hours you sleep for eight hours and you have eight hours of family and social time and if from a, in an academic world if you're like sending emails after 4 p.m. or on weekends, you actually get told off, you know, like quite strongly. Um, and that's a very idealistic, lovely world perspective. But, you know, they really value, you know, this family time, social time. Um, why can't we value something like that within coaching? And I think, again, like going slightly off topic, but if we look at gender and you're know, where are all the women in coaching? And again, there was a study done in Norway by Annie Crony. Um, and she, I think it was the age of 29, there's a huge drop off for female coaches because that might be the age where they might go, they might have a family. So then coaching and, and working 24 seven does not become feasible for female coaches or uh, you know, male coaches that have a, an equal co-parenting role. Um, so that's, you know, it's, there's a significant impact on family time, mental health, um, well-being, etc. Why do you think, um, why do you think it's got to this, Jen? What, what's, um, why is this creep that's just sort of the boiling frog that we've, the temperature's rising, the temperature's rising, the workload's increasing, no one's really questioning it, people perhaps like the example given by Amy have actually reinforced it and amplified it and it's been a fairly crude but but um and and glib way of saying don't I work hard look at me why, why has this occurred it's a massive question Steve. I know massive. it is but I thought I, I thought you'd have I, I, thought, <laughs> I thought you'd just go I'll tell you what it was it was that person over no. there that started <laughs> off <one win. laughs> you know what comes um but I guess there's responsibilities within the sporting world and then there's the and then the society and the influence that society's having more is better. Um, you know, the, the perception that everything is daisy and great and amazing and thumbs up and life is good. And we take this great shot and filter it 900 times in the sporting world. We see coaches mask all the the, the internal dialogue and trouble that they're having and navigating this space, the loneliness, the coping mechanisms that they use. I've witnessed it firsthand um, in the different roles that I've been in over 25 years in, in dressing rooms. And it, it's just really unhealthy and it's really sad. It, it definitely pulls on a heartstring of mine when I work with a coach and we, you know, there's a, again a perception that you might go in and talk about the nitty gritty details of coaching when really there's a lot of other things around burnout and mental health and well-being that that comes to the surface when they have that trusted space that they can they can share in and is that due to then people feeling isolated this siloed approach that I think some people reported they've particularly experienced during the COVID work from home space where it was head down and let's get more so we start our work a little bit earlier we finish a little bit later and um, we answer at all hours and we then have no boundaries so there's a multitude of things where the responsibility of the organization is to say, hey, we acknowledge that we can put some boundaries in place. We can acknowledge that this is our way of operating. This is what we support. I think there's some organizations that have um, on this return to work space that we've been part of in the last six to eight months where they've said, actually, do you know, Wednesday afternoons, let's not put anything in the diary from a meeting um, if we want to have flexible working hours. So I think in some cases, sports have been able to adopt that. Other sports have um, different restrictions, to, you know, rental of um, facilities, etc. But I think underneath it all and, and 
uh, Colin Cronin talks nicely about this in the caring coaching. It's caring about each other. It's this asking people, are you okay? It's sharing the burden. It's not necessarily problematizing everything so that everything is reflected in a negative way. And we're trying to get more and, and find this marginal uh, gain as we can. <laughs> we, we won't scratch the surface of that. But this extra 1% when really um, the, there's so many cracks in the foundation. So there is this weight that we know that's existed for a really long time in high performance that, that medals have certain values and what it takes to win. I'm delighted to see that we have what it takes to win well. Do I think we're living and breathing it? No. Um, is it a longer time coming? Yes, it is. But we have to stick to that and the consistency when people talk about high performance and what high performance is, although the book isn't just for high performance coaches. I've seen that this, we need to be consistent across a multitude of different areas to support people in this area. And then the ripple effect will start to come. I as a coach and my coaching team or my volunteer team or my parents who are helping out, whatever it is, we're on the same page. We're having great conversations. We understand a way of operating that's healthy for the people in front of us and for ourselves. So I don't think there's, you know, that's a, a, a probably a, a roundabout and waffly way, but there's there's some elements in there that I really feel strongly about. Can I jump I, in there? Yeah, go on. Yeah, so one of the things I was just thinking about then, and this is more of a, a thought or a question for us, is when we talk about this 24-7, I, we have to hold our hands up and say this is a very westernised perspective on you know, you know, the, the role of the coach. So I'd be really interested, and this is something that me and Jen talk about all the time, is looking at different um, cultural perspectives. Is this the case in every culture or, you know, part of the world? Um, because I do think that if we look at, again, I'm going off on tangent a little bit, if you look at the working patterns and within different cultures we are the western culture is all about like you said earlier you know the harder you work in it it's all about, all about people who are around the most or you know are more visible and that's you know that's um applicable across you know different not just coaching different um different roles different jobs and i think especially within high performance sport where if you're not producing medals then you are on the chopping block and you know you you replaced so there's there's a constant feeling of in a lot of sports of um you know unease um we don't feel safe so maybe there's this culture of i have to be seen to be working 24 7 to be seen to be working hard to be trying to you know win these medals and and keep my job at the end of the day yeah and i think that parallels really relevant um that um, I think that there's a growing conversation about staff well-being in sport, and I think that's that's really useful. I think there's also an understanding that if you want to work in this sphere, then the game will be on Saturday. <laughs> it, it's not a Monday to Friday um, operation, and so that's just an acceptance of that, and that there is a demand um, that is slightly different. And um, I think it. I think sort of moving out and consulting for like the last six years or so, and spending more time with businesses is certainly something I've noticed. Where probably we've got this this preconceived idea of oh everyone in sports working hard, or you get on a train at five o'clock in the morning and you'll see a lot of grafters. <laughs> um, and having worked and coached a number of executives to. I guess, I guess what you'd call high performance around sleep, nutrition, diet, focus, um, that there's an essential aspect of the job. They have, if, as the CEO, they have to be there. There's no alternative of sending the deputy, otherwise they won't get the, the, the gig, they won't get the big contract, which parallels with coaching. You have to be there a certain amount of time, but you could be more intentional more thoughtful about resting about looking after yourself um, about empowering others to take ownership so that they're a little bit more in control of their session rather than you having to be on the stopwatch and, and measuring everything um, yeah it does strike me as a, as a as a decent parallel where I think the business world's starting to really cotton on to this and that leads me to, to the next question about I think in the business world, 
they're doing it because it gives disproportionate results. When an executive's core, they're, they're not they're not athletic performers, they're elite decision makers, and so the quality of their decision making can can improve you know, disproportionately if they start looking after themselves. And I suppose that's a bit like Eddie Howe's quote um, about putting more work in. It's going to be counterproductive. Is there a growing body of evidence that that actually taking less time on task is enhancing the quality of the work on task? I think it's a really, really good point. And maybe um, as we move into spaces where there's different ways of operating and different mindsets that come in, that diversity of thought, I do think there's a there is a hard work element to it. It's not it's the same when we look at fast tracking coaches. It's the same when people say I want to get my degree or my certificate in this in 20 minutes online. Whoa, hang on a minute here. <laughs> you have a responsibility. You sign up to the job. You add value to the environment. But it's this idea when you get inside whatever space you operate in of whether are you valued by the organization or um do they value you? Like, is there a, is there a value in say the organizations? What was that quote? Are you, are you of value to the organization? Sorry. Or are you valued by them? And this sense of belonging, the sense of value. I, I don't think we can take away from any particular sport or organization. I'm living in London. I see the tubes full at five in the morning as if it was the middle of the day, <laughs> you know, people uh, running, squeezing things into time, knowing what's good for their own well-being and great. We can have advice around the five ways to well-being. But if if you don't need to fit within those, if, if something different works for you. But as you said, Steve, there's a multitude of core things that need to be there. Um, around your your sleep and understanding your nutrition and what works for you and um, this sense of um, networking but in a social aspect too that you had there's a, a somewhat of a balance that works for you not this um, work-life balance sometimes it's lovely for people to have the work that blends into their life and and that thought that that can be fresh in, in the, the groups that they operate in but I do think there's a reality of what you sign up for uh, the added value but then this I think the extra part of the 24 seven is if you choose to work later at night or you choose to work early in the morning, that there's a space for you in the middle of the day or the evening that you go and catch up with some people and you, you get a different perspective on things. You get a, a vibrancy to your personality, to your uh, energy levels that then you can come into this group or this organization, this coaching poolside and, and bring to them. Because our athletes have a periodization plan. So why can't we apply the same principles to our coaches? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's it's certainly something I noticed going to the Olympics for the first time in 2000. I was at my worst. I mean, I wasn't effective because I didn't know what I was doing. I was under pressure. I was nervous. Um, and I was reacting in a way that made me go, oh, hang on a minute. I need to change the way I am doing this because I potentially could be nudging someone in the wrong direction. And that if we expect our athletes to be at their peak mentally physically emotionally spiritually at the time of competition we should we should require that or we should be encouraging and supporting even the tools and resources and training to our coaches when it when it really matters um and and those small incidences day to day when um when they're having a a, a conversation with an athlete and for that athlete it really matters but if they are afraid or they're um, they're bullish uh, or they're impatient or they're not giving them the attention, that's not going to make them feel valued. And that means that they're probably not going to engage again. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't. It feels like this. This if we were th if, as you say, Jen, if we're thinking about marginal gains, this is probably one of the massive gains that you just prioritize a bit more because you want to be more effective, because you want to support people to a higher level of performance and um and in, uh, participation in sport. Yeah, that, yeah, that's One the, yeah. Thing just, we just, uh, that, no, just need this to change. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> go on, just, go I, on, I was just going to say, um, one of the things that I um, feel really strongly about here is that it, if people are listening and they feel like, yeah, this is actually something I could, uh, it's given me the courage to maybe have a conversation or to check in with myself. 
that I didn't want it to be a lot of the what. And that's what I think I hope the chapters do as well, that they're not just reading more what's, what it is you should be doing, what it is you shouldn't be doing, what are the implications of this, it's the how. So some coaches sitting there and going, yeah, that's me. I recognize me in that conversation, I recognize me in that chapter. So how, how can we support you to make that change, to have the conversation, to set some boundaries or reset some boundaries, to um, check in what do you actually look like at your best self? What were you like 10 years ago, 15 years ago when you were coaching, working in corporate space to then stop and go, OK, I need to get back to there. And, and I think that's what came back to some of um, the spaces that Amy and I were operating in is that coaches had absorbed a lot of the how, or sorry, a lot of the, the what and not a lot of the how. So they were still left standing or sitting at the end of a, um, a, a book, a webinar a conversation with someone going, okay, <laughs> so where do I go from here? Hmm. And on a similar tack, um, you, you mentioned a couple of chapters around male female differences and so male female differences and perhaps the way they tra train and so you know this preconception that that you need to be coaching in a different way for males and and females um but also the kind of hierarchical or lack of equality that that seems to have arisen around well i might i might earn my stripes of working in female sport and that would be a lovely little place I can make mistakes and use it as a stepping stone for the for the grand job of of working with male elite athletes um you you tackle that quite nicely in this in this um in this area what are the common things that seem to come up in in uh, in your discussions with coaches and what they're encountering in this area literally every other week uh, we hear coaches saying oh but you know girls like it this way and boys like it this way <laughs> Um, and I think, so they're, they're the biggest things. And then I have to, I was telling Jen, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and there was this big debate and I had to really bite my tongue not to say, have you not read our book? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think the both of these chapters, what they do really well is explain, you know, why these myths occur so you know where they come from and the historical and social cultural reasonings for you know why um girls and boys men and women um are, are kind of talked about differently and for historically you know um or even from a you know a social context if you look at schools and um amanda visek in the the fun chapter, she always also talks about these gender mm. differences, but you see it all the time. And now I can't unsee it the way girls are, you know, given a pink pen and boys are given a blue pen and girls are encouraged to be polite and, um, and sociable and kind, whereas boys are, uh, are encouraged to be competitive and aggressive. So literally from, from birth, you've got this like socialization of these two groups of people that then that transpires into like how we, we perceive men and women to, to the, the, how they like to be coached. When actually, if you, if we ask like in Amanda's chapter, if you ask, um, you know, males and females, what is fun to you? It's exactly the same. They see fun in the, in the same way, you know, girls are just as competitive as boys but it's our perception as coaches' perceptions on the world that then kind of try and mould these individuals in, in different ways. And I think the biggest one for me is if we all become more aware, can we then, you know, change our behaviour and treat people, these young people equally, treat them as individuals rather than two separate kind of completely, you know, one is from Venus, one is from Mars kind of groups. That's my kind of issue i guess with uh, the way we approach gender and coaching yeah i really like that chapter on fun and it's that lovely section about look male female find the same things fun old young and and numerous other the ways in which we we cut and divide society into different types of groups just thinking that that we should we should be attending to a particular group in a certain way for for preconceived ideas. I quite like that in that sense of uh, um, my daughters came home the other day, so we had an end of uh, um, end of week game around us, and I was like, I'd love a game around us right now. <laughs> and it was just that sense of 
I don't know whether I'm going to get a chance to play rounders in the next uh, 10 years, but maybe I should be looking for that and su- going around suggesting game of rounders in the village or something. I don't know. No, it, and that, sorry, that's a great point because I'm very biased in that. I'm like saying, you know, um, we treat boys this way and girls this way and you know, it's unfair on, on girls or women. But actually, yeah, are we treating women in a way that we're excluding men? So you're completely right. And I think, yeah, thanks for making you know me more aware of, of that process, thought process. Um, and, and then... So, Jen, did you have any follow-up th- follow thoughts about the, the male-female discussions in the book at all? Yeah. <laughs> no, not, okay, not that, necessarily in the a, follow-up. <laughs> that had a right. How long, you, how long have you got Zoom recording for? Cause <laughs> I'm about to let to off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, to be, to be fair, Amy's hit on a lot of really... Um, really great points that do link into the chapters Ali Bose has done that great chapter on stepping stone I think what what makes me so um animated about this is that we we are seeing it on a daily basis and we do need to check and challenge ourselves like I was um listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about how uh, somebody at a dinner party where their kids were present university level students were saying oh your son is so passionate and driven in his area and your daughter is beautiful and what we put the value on the 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 looks and aesthetics of of um women and and i'm sure ambition and drive come in there in the top five somewhere but the men are how um driven they are how honest and loyal and moral they are and there's a research paper to go with that that i can find um but yeah it just it just caught me thinking how often do i say those things when i go to my sister's kids and one is three and i'm like oh yeah um you know he's really good at this and oh shit, they're so gorgeous aren't they <laughs> now, now i also say let's get out and get a hurley and go and play on the pitch but um there's there's so many examples of coaches as you said steve who come into spaces and go oh this will be easier for me and then they'll when it's not so easy they'll default to oh women are so difficult they want to know all the details of everything oh come on now oh come on (laughs) so (laughs) what ways are you trying what perspectives have you got on things who's supporting you to check and challenge these ways of operating um is it is that because in the formal qual path that you took they said x y and z and have you challenged it since then now i'm not saying that all organizations are setting a curriculum that is that needs to be constantly checked and challenged but if they get to a point where they're only seeing things a certain way then we have three chapters here that challenge it from all different angles that we would encourage people to grab a hold of and see you know does it match the environment they're in how can you make an environment or create an environment rather that has this at the at the center of it when we talk about being athlete centered um a whole other a whole other conversation but who are these people in your environment so i know if you come over to west ham highly competitive argumentative at some points when we don't have um when we we try to constrain some of the sessions and this oh that was offside it wasn't and we're doing this game what is it to is it worth points you know really competitive environment as, as a set of professional athletes gender doesn't come into that for them you know and when people say they need to have x y and z or they're only in it for certain reasons it just really it really bothers me that we've just taken away a whole um a whole section of their life to pencil them into one that one simple little box and i was just laughing there because we all i always hear this yeah um girls like girls and women they, they really like to you know discuss things and like i like to give them a bit of time before the session to socialize whereas you know the lads just like to get on with it and be told what to do and it's a complete generalization um and completely like reiterating these like st- gender stereotypes by you know spouting this stuff in in and in, in coach education courses or even you know conferences with quite high profile coaches or coach educators in there um yeah it really kind of hurts my ears <laughs> when i hear that uh, it sort of strikes me as just a bigger point and, and it maybe sort of leads me on to a, the, one of the other topics and, and maybe one of the final ones I'll explore because I could just go through them all and we could just have a good old chin wag about all the topics. But um, it, the the one around being cruel to be kind and caring coaching and I, I suppose the bridging from male, female, um, this myth about coaching female athletes differently from males 
um, as well as do I need to be tough to be uh, a strong coach or an effective coach? It just sort of seems to lack this sophistication that you're going to have positive regard for the person that's in front of you and you're going to coach the person in front of you and what they need and what's best for them in a way that encourages them to grow and develop regardless of their their gender, their colour of their skin, their background. Um, it's just that sort of I suppose just pure hope that somebody's going to look after that person and adapt and respond to what's in front of them rather than, oh, I've seen this one before, I'll just click work and give you my simple version of what I've done before. That doesn't really strike me as the most effective way of coaching. Um, it, much more about who have I got in front of me? What, 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 what do I need to do, be doing to help them? That wasn't a question. Um, <laughs> just a little but, statement there. <laughs> but I think you've articulated that really well, Steve. And I think that's the crux of the whole book is every chapter comes down to knowing the individual and knowing kind of, you know, their biographies, you know, how they like to be cared for. So Colin talks really well and he did a great webinar for us um, last week. You know, some people might like to be... Um, spoken to in a certain way that might not be perceived as caring by somebody else um, being caring doesn't mean that we don't require our athletes to work hard and, and put a lot of effort in and difficult conversations have to be had at a certain time but it's about knowing that individual and knowing kind of what their uh, their preferences are or you know what makes them tick and he talks about these wants and needs like you know we all have wants but is it what they need and having a coach understand what a, an athlete needs is, is really important so yeah like um I'm now butchering your well articulated summary of the book but it completely comes down to you know individual differences understanding the individual um and and yeah coaching in a way that caters to that um okay a couple of last questions then just to sort of wrap up um what what do you hope the legacy of the book is is going to be? Hmm. Oh gosh, it's a good one. The immediate answer, the first answer that comes is that it's a support structure. That's it's something that people can, even in the physical touch of the book, light, pick it up. The chapters are short, but they have depth. Um that is so yeah. A support that it 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 I, this it might be really big and naive and and egotistical a change we want people to read certain chapters and change the way they operate change the way they think about something change um if it's the 24 7 coach if it's that they perceive questioning to equal learning then actually when they read the chapter and they see that there's a whole other area that they can explore around questioning and the way they question and how often or you know all that um if it was around learning styles if it was around deliberate practice of this ten thousand hours that they get a chance to go Oof, okay i need to adapt or adopt a certain, certain or different way or completely reject the way i've been doing it or this says for the moment until i have the space to do that and they don't feel alone in the support reference that they they feel that actually through either research avenue the webinars that we're putting on or coming to either of us and we can signpost them to um the relevant chapter authors that there's a community of people going forward for the better of the people that they have in front of them um, and coaching is not in most in most sections of the world not the most best paid job so it's there's a heart and there's a care in that that we really want to amplify um, and see if people can understand care and bring it to their coaching and challenge those who don't uh, want to hear about it mm. and so besides the merchandise um what um what's the next step you alluded to a follow-up book um what's what's the next steps for pursuing this as a cause for you so yeah we are um working on a follow-up book and it's more myths of sport performance rather than specifically coaching um we have had people get in touch and say have you thought about this myth or that myth and um there are myths that kind of don't 
sit specifically within coaching that we still but, but coaches still need to be aware of but at the same time performance analysts need to be aware of nutritionists should be aware of anyone working in sport performance um so you know policy makers that kind of thing um yeah and p- coaches different practitioners have been throwing kind of new ideas and um and myths at us so it's not difficult to kind of you know follow up on a, a second book so yeah hopefully by next year and um, there'll be a, a miss of, of performance available wow i can't wait to read it that sounds amazing <laughs> But don't don't rule out the merchandise. I know you you haven't really responded to it. I'm just imagining like a T-shirt that with like a little tick box, so you can just take the ones off that you're not using anymore, or something like that. Um, we'll we'll speak to the publisher. <laughs> yeah, you can get these these posters now of like of all the sort of essential um, books that you should read. You can scratch the the ones off when you've read it. Um, Love that. Look, so impressed with this work. Um, it's been presented in such a way that, that I think is, is really accessible, uh, it's non-threatening, uh, it's helpful for people. That, that means that just the, v- the very act of reading the contents can allow people to go, oh, oh, well, that's in a myth. Okay, there's, that's backed up by um, authoritative uh, authors and writers and... They know what they're talking about here, and it's presented in a way that means that we're going to give you a balanced view on this. Um, so congratulations on, on putting the book together, assembling a, a crack team of authors. Um, just lastly, where can people find more? You, you alluded to webinars. Is there a set of resources that people can, can go and, and find a bit more? Yeah, so within the book itself, there's a QR code within every chapter. So you can just scan that and it'll take you to the Sequoia YouTube page and it'll kind of, the, each author gives you a little bit of information about the chapter and them. Um, the last Wednesday of every month, we've also got a webinar which covers a different chapter from the book and the, the authors of Kindly, as Jen mentioned, come on to to talk about and go a little bit deeper into the chapter and allow for people to ask questions. And again, that's then housed on the YouTube page for the Sequoia, the um, the, the publishing company. Um, so yeah, Andy, the, Ed, the who, who runs the company, uploads them every week. So, so far we've got three um, recordings of the three webinars that we've run. So yeah, in the next kind of, over the next 20 months, they'll be all up there and available. And then if anyone wants to buy the book, it's available on Amazon. And there's still, I think, 21% or something um, weird like that uh, discount. So it's uh, another thing that we forgot to mention is that it's super affordable. I think it's like $13.99 or something like that on Amazon, which is something that, again, we're really passionate about. Um, I'm always harping on in academia. You see some, some of these books that are 120 quid, and I think, how is anyone going to afford to read that? So that's something that um, us and the publishers are, are, are really kind of, like, we're really passionate to, to do. So, yeah, um, there's kind of all different ways to get in touch. All the authors as well on them. Uh, on the YouTube videos do give their contact details and everyone is really open to people getting in touch. Similarly, me and Jen are always open to uh, answer any questions or hear from people that have read the book. And where can people follow you? Where's the best place to, to follow you both? Um, for me, via email or on Twitter, a underscore whitehead one and Jen. Yeah, Twitter. I like to share other people's great work so you can find me at jenny cody 10 on twitter or email and then we'd set up a conversation and a big share and listener so yeah um you drop me an email at jenny cody at gmail.com amazing fantastic we'll put all the links in the show notes but jen amy thank you so much thanks steve thank you steve